You are all actors, is that right? Yes, in other words. Excellent. Well, I mean, you know, I feel like, you know, all we're all a little bit of other things because, you know, it's hard to make a living as an actor in such a just society where, you know, where there's so many of us, so many actors. And so that's why I'm excited to share this um, new form with you as a place to perform because there's not a lot of people on this platform right now and you could have some exciting opportunities quickly if you start um you know you start working with us it got written up yay oh wonderful right. so you've got your host <laughs> great yes, this is our good. our other uh our other good. analyst this is Witt and frank um we just want to make sure that we stay kind of close to the front of the stage because uh okay. That makes it feel a little bit more intimate and better for our cameraman and our other cameraman. Thank you. Guys. <laughs> so, Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're it's only twelve oh one. So, uh, we were. I was just asking uh, about everyone who what their level of performances was, um, and I was just saying how this platform is super exciting because it offers an opportunity that most of us don't have to perform and quickly move up the ladder of visibility because there aren't a lot of people doing the stuff in here and so all of a sudden you're you're on the cutting edge and it's quite <laughs> an exciting place to be that's um, true but it's also one of the issues i would say because there aren't a lot of actors who are uh, you know able to do it all without some sort of tense uh training period on just how to perform in VR. Yeah, it certainly, um, it certainly helps um, to to come to something like this and get yeah. out from people who've done it before so you can <laughs> shortcut yourself to knowing how to do it. Uh, wow. I, I've been doing it for about two years now and I think you too as well as about Same. two years been doing You're it. You're an experienced uh, immersive performer as well, huh? uh, previous I am. to that. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm a, as well, also an experienced performer. And uh, I I acted know. once. I don't I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, Brian I is just, our, gotta, our world builder before, so. and one of the founders, uh, co-founders of Ferryman Collective. And um, our our Brian Brian's um, Discord username is Krampus. So mm -hmm. our show last December was Krampus Knock, and I'm gonna. Bet you all can guess who played Krampus. There we go. The role I was born to play. Was, yes. I mean, listen to that voice. I mean, how can you not play Krampus with that voice, right? Right. Uh, oh, <laughs> we've got some claps on that one. Right. So, uh, how many of you here are new to acting in general? Anybody here new to acting in general? Like, I'm just starting out. Ooh, okay, uh, oh, we've got two. Excellent. Okay. Hi, welcome. Welcome to, cool. uh, you know, acting, which is a crazy, a crazy experiment <laughs> in life. Um, how about somebody who's been acting? I would say uh, like you're at a moderate level, like you've done some stuff and you, you're feeling pretty good about where you're at. You have a moderate level of acting. Maybe been doing it for a few years now. Yeah. Let's say doing it for about Uh, and do we have any long-term performers? You know, 10 years <laughs> doing it since middle school. Hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I know. All right. Uh, hey, okay. cool. Uh, what about immersive theater specifically? Do we have any immersive theater actors? Oh, hey. Yeah. All right, very cool. Awesome. Towards the microphone. The mic can do, let me see if I, I do my amplify. There we go. Is that better? There you go. Okay, all right. So, uh, so immersive theater specifically, we have quite a few here. That's cool. That. And then, uh, voice actors, any like that's your main thing, voice acting or voiceover? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I know, at least for myself, uh, especially if you live in New York or L.A., you sort of do a bit of everything. 
most of the time. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering for our immersive actors, which of them were LA mm -hmm. and which of them were New York. That's where the only place that y'all live, right? That, that's like, that, I think that's, <laughs> that's true. I don't know. <laughs> in uh, Austin and uh, yeah I know Atlanta is becoming pretty hip right now Wheeler, where did Deirdre go I don't know we lost Deirdre um, right. so well, we'll start we in are... a minute as soon as she comes yes. back I suppose yes indeed um, lovely to see so many has... familiar faces I recognize a lot of these people from that <laughs> it's our social club and VR lives yay so. Always lovely yes. to have the crew out. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I make Yay. music. We got Anna. Awesome. We got all sorts of people. Oh, yeah, lots of friends in the audience. That's always nice. Yes. Always Please. prefer that. Oh, there's your dish. All right. Well, it's uh, five past. Actually, that's sort of one of the uh, fabulous things about you know, art <laughs> is technology is another character in your show. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. it's good to be adaptable. And yeah. be able to respond to whatever rises, yes. Yes, that that happens. You know, the world, you know, people fall out of the world and then you have to adjust. Um, so, yeah, we were just talking about starting. Did we want to go ahead and start? Yeah, I think so. All right. Well, first of all, let me go ahead and introduce uh, you all to our lovely camera team. Woo -woo. Let's raise the roof Woo. for Carlos Austin Woo. and Andrew Burr. Thank you so much, friends. Thank you, thank you, thank they you. Are they are on YouTube right now. So there you go. Yeah. Recording this and streaming it for the general public um, because they're, they're because they're awesome, right? And they're my friends, and they um they're here to make that happen. I think you're ready, Carlos. I didn't see hearts yet. You want to give me some hearts when you're ready? Well, otherwise, oh, I got some hearts. Okay, so we're gonna start. <laughs> All right. So here, right. here's me being dramatic now. <clears throat> okay. Theater in virtual reality, it's its not new, but it is gaining in popularity as people discover this. Well, it's a wonderful storytelling platform and VR theater offers the feeling of embodiment and immersion that closely mimics the experience of attending a theatrical event in person. It's vibrant, it's engaging, there's a richness of experience experience combined with the rapid growth of technologies, the increased visibility for local theater groups that can now have global audiences. It is set to revive the ancient art of theater that has been in competition with movies and TV. You know, people no longer, you know, they no longer have to drive to a location to experience theater. They can do it right from their homes. My name is Deirdre V. Lyons, and this is Witten Frank, and that is Brian Tull. Both Witten and I are producers and performers in the Fair and um, the Ferryman Collective's current show, Severance Theory. Welcome to Respite. Brian is uh, a producer and a world builder on the same show, and a, a former actor on one of our previous shows. The Severance Theory Welcome to Respite is live theater in virtual reality. It held its premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival this last year. Its international premiere at the at this year's 78th. Venice International Film Festival, of which I was able to attend in person, which was amazing, even though it's crazy. Um, and then it's Asian premiere at the Koshung Film Festival in Taiwan. And we are currently performing shows for Raindance in London, the yeah, Raindance Immersive and Film Festival through November 21st. Now, a little background on me. Uh, since 2016, I've been working with the top immersive theater companies in Los Angeles. Then in 2019, I joined the ensemble cast of The Under Presents an immersive theater experience in VR that was selected as a finalist for an Emmy Award for Outstanding Innovation in Interactive Media and a winner of the VR Awards Experience of the Year, as well as a Shakespearean production from the same studio tender clause called The Under Presents Tempest, a live, art scripted, art improvised, immersive experience that audiences attended from home using a virtual reality headset, winner of Best in Narrative Experience at the Rain Dance Film Festival as well. And this is where Witten and I met, as she was also a cast member on The Under Presents and in The Under Presents Tempest. So that is where we met. Now, um, yeah. I was also a performer in Finding Pandora X with Double Eye Studios, winner of the best immersive experience in the Venice VR Extended, the, the official virtual reality competition of the 77th annual Venice International Film Festival, so two years ago. I then started performing and producing live VR immersive experience experiences with a group of creators that I co-founded 
I'm with Ryan Tall called the Ferryman Collective and that Witten joined after we did Para and Krampusnacht and Krampusnacht, oh, actually Witten joined us for Para and then we did Krampusnacht and then Krampusnacht was a finalist for the PGA Innovation Award. Oh my God, how did that happen? And that brings us up to date, the current show. Welcome, Rusty. Sorry, just wanted to get all that through no, no, so no, that no. you they... could know why the heck we're yeah. up here telling you about this thing <laughs> called VR theater. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah uh, Deirdre and I know each other from The Underpresents and The Tempest uh, by Tender Claws. I'm so yes, I've been a professional actor since 2010 in Los Angeles. Um, I've done film, television, and voiceover. You can hear me on a few podcasts right now. I also narrate audiobooks on Audible. So yeah, and I've been doing the immersive VR theater since 2019, which is very exciting and sort of a fun combination of all of various skills. And yes, and, and I'm also Brian. a member of the Ferryman Collective. And Brian? That's correct. All right, my uh, I've been involved in the VR community since uh, around 2014, 2015, when those first uh, development kits were released. So I've been a VR enthusiast for a very long time. Uh, shortly after that, I started working for Horror Buzz, which is a site that reviews everything horror. Uh, and I started covering a lot of immersives, uh, including the, the shows that uh, that Deirdre was in. So that's where I got involved with immersives. And then in 2019, I became aware of The Unge Presents, which was a wonderful experience that brought together the two things that I really love, VR and immersive theater. So I got involved with that community, which got me a little bit more into contact with Deirdre and with Witten to a certain degree. And um, as that was was wrapping up, I just said I would really like to get involved with this. You know, I had some experience as a hobbyist 3D modeler and animator, and I figured, you know, let's let's do a fun little thing for Halloween. To, as the the game is kind of falling, kind of starting to go away, let's bring the community together for one last hurrah. And we did something a little fun with with Para last year for Halloween, and we just wanted to keep it on going. Things were going well, and people were spot responding well to it so i continued my work as a world builder producer occasional actor with uh, the ferryman collective and now we've been able to bring you welcome to respite and we're excited for all of the future projects to come yes so let's start with uh what does it mean to be a performer in virtual reality Witten? well <laughs> i mean it's, it's weirdly similar to being performer in real life, right? You're utilizing a lot of the same skills. It's a very, I would say, much more intimate experience. So you're sort of combining, I think we've described it as the connection of film, theater, and gaming. So in terms of acting skills, I find myself using a lot of theatrical techniques, but with a more voiceover slash filmic perspective. So I'm usually talking much more intimately with one or two people. So you're using a much different kind of perspective, but a lot of the skills you utilize, I would say, come from a theatrical background like mask work or puppetry. And even uh, to some extent, um, sort of spatial movement uh, and various movement techniques, other movement techniques there. I think it's a combination of a lot of different performance skills, on top of which, for a lot of these productions, you're going to be the one controlling what is happening in the world. On top of focusing on your performance and making connections with the participants, you're also having to be your own stage manager slash ops master <laughs> slash uh, costume and run crew. So it, it is a lot. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly, uh, it certainly is. And I just want to give a quick overview of what the difference between, you know, immersive theater and proscenium theater is. A, a lot of people are, probably already know this, but for those of you that don't, um, proscenium theater is, of course, you know, behind a fourth wall and you sit in your chairs and you look up at the stage at the actors that are performing. The reason that we've decided to do um, immersive theater, which means that we break the fourth wall, we bring the audience, you know, into the space with us, uh, is because I just feel like this is an incredible platform for immersive theater and it's so much more intimate and it's so much more um, interesting uh, 
for me as as an experience um because there aren't a lot of nuances in the space yet and i think that's going to change as technology changes we'll get you know higher fidelity you know, facial features and you know all the like you know, facial recognition the full body tracking all that but it isn't actually needed right it, it, you don't have to have that to have an effective performance to have an effective emotional connection with an audience member and but i don't think it works with you know as well with the audience out out there and the actors up here bring the audience into the space with us and we we interact with them so for example in the severance theory welcome to respite um, the star of the show is our Alex. It's the seven-year-old child. So we, as the parents playing either the mom or dad, are interacting with Alex in the show and, you know, improvising with them as they talk or if we ask them a question. That's sort of the difference between immersive theater and proscenium theater. And I have seen proscenium theater done here. It's done very well. I've seen some great shows and I, I, I don't want to put anybody off of it if that's their preference. But... Um, some people who don't know about immersive theater or they can, they've only heard about Sleep No More in New York or, or maybe The Willows in L.A. Um, and they haven't experienced it. Well, that's what it is. And that's that's why we do immersive theaters, because I just feel like it's a great platform to, to bring our audience into experience something that only is available in the big cities. Yeah. Um, so what are the opportunities in VR? Do you mean in terms of performance or in terms of what VR allows you to do? It might be Let's different. Let's start with than... one and then go to the other. Yeah. <laughs> so at the moment, I suppose the performance opportunities are fairly limited. It's, it's a lot of people like us coming up with our own companies and agendas and trying to make VR theater more readily available and known in the larger world. Uh, but I know there's, I know quite a lot of people are very excited about it. So there definitely are opportunities coming. Definitely make sure that you are checking the no proscenium call sheet and to date on some of the discords that are working with VR specifically, I would say. And we yeah. can send you those links if you're interested. Yeah. Uh, in terms of what VR theater, oh, sorry. Well, I would just add. I would just add that you know, if you're if you're a, a brave and creative soul, though, you don't have to wait for those opportunities. You can you can just go out and start doing it right now, right? You know, there's Alt Space. Mm -hmm. There's there's um, we work in VR Chat. There's Neos. There's you know whatever is your favorite you know social VR platform. Find a world in there, and you can stage a show right right now. I mean, comedians are doing it. Musicians are doing it. You can do it. I would only say if you're going to try to sell tickets to your show that, you know, you get permissions from the world builders and the people that have contributed to your show or go out into a community like, you know, start hanging out in Altspace or what, or your favorite social platform and get to know some of the people that are there and some world builders, you know, form a small group of people who are interested in that and want to help you on your journey. I mean, that's how we came together, you know, Brian was like, I'm going to build a world in VR chat because I want to do this. And I said, okay, I'll come in and help you. Let's, let's do this. And, you know, there was Braden there and I brought, I told Steve, you know, help, help us out with this and just started that way. And then it grew and in, in a year, right in a year, we go from para, which is a 20 minute, you know, cute proof of concept to our second show being a finalist in the PGA innovation award. I mean, it was it was just that easy to being in some of the biggest film festivals in the world, right? So that's that is also there for you. There aren't a lot of people in the space doing it. So if you want to get out there and start doing it in in a very quick amount of time, you can find a community, you can start performing, you can start, you know, do a do a monologue slam, you know, with your best friends, you know, get get out there and just Get started and see where that leads you. And then you were going to talk about the other oh, opportunities. I was actually, oh yes. Well, I think what you touched on earlier, one of the surprising things about VR theater is the ability to create the same emotional catharsis that one might have in watching live theater or particularly good film or television. 
one of the things that we found really interesting in the under presents was that you didn't need an avatar that had high fidelity eyes or even a mouth <laughs> to have the audience feel a sense of connection with that person because as performers that's a thing we are trained to do right to foster connection and intimacy and things like that and that still comes across even in this sort of this sort of environment even in the VR world so don't feel like you have to have these super crazy avatars you know or super hyper realistic that's not necessary what is necessary yeah. of course is to utilize your training as a performer that's all still there all of those techniques you've learned at school or in the real world from experiences they're all going to come into play here perhaps even more so because you do have to get across this boundary of this kind of overtly false world once you do you find that the connections are just as real for us with the underpresents it created this whole and base that I think was really surprising to all of us because the participants felt very strong connections to the live performers who were able to build stories with them go on their own emotional journeys without even you know a very like strong realistic mm -hmm. uh, character was, that was pretty incredible so that's one of the things that I think you want to keep in mind. Don't don't be too worried that people will be put off by the the VR environment. I I have found that that is almost universally untrue. <laughs> well, in some um, ways, it, it people can be a little yeah. even more vulnerable because they are at home in a safe place. They're behind a mask, literally. Um, they're a bit anonymous, so they can they can be a little bit more emotionally available to you. And our voices are so powerful. We're so used to listening to people on the phone or listening to our family members in the other room or talking to each other that we're really good at picking up subtle emotional changes in a voice. And that's what carries our emotion is our voice in this case. Um, Brian, I wanted to ask you as a world builder, what are some of the things you have to think about when building a world specifically for performance versus just puzzle or a game you know of a more straight up the the way i like to put it is 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 that in a traditional game experience it's all about the player it's all about whoever is is embodying that character and in, is going through that world uh and that is still very important you know it, i guess i guess the, the closest thing to our player in welcome to respite is our alex character that interacts with with the audience or with with, with our with our performers um, but in a game perspective and in, in a traditional, uh, you know, single player experience, your focus is very much on what is, what is that player going to be experienced? What are they going to be interacting with? How are they going to interface with the world? And this, and, and, and live performance almost puts more of that onus on the, on the, what would traditionally be the non-player characters, the NPCs, the people in, in the world, which are traditionally more of just an extension of the story you know they, they are an embodiment of the story that doesn't really serve any particular pr uh, purpose other than creating the feeling that you're interacting with something versus just getting a, a page of text but for what we're doing it's it's very much in how do how do the inhabitants of the world interface with the world and how does that uh create this experience that allows allows the the uh audi the audience member to almost feel like there is a world outside of this world. I think that's such an important thing whenever you're, you're dealing with anything immersive is you don't want to let on that there are limits and there are walls here. So when when we show someone interacting with with an object, when you, you know, we pouring the macaroni and cheese or stir or, you know, stirring it or doing all these various things that they're doing. We don't want to let on that they're that, that we're only showing you the few things that they can interact with. Most of the world is static. But we, we, we have these smoke ears up that anything that they are interacting with, we want to show you that they actually are able to deal with it in a naturalistic way. And that creates this impression that, that the world is less bounded than it actually is. Witten, how do you deal with props uh, as an avatar and as a, a virtual <laughs> being? 
as an avatar. Well, it definitely takes practice, and you do rely heavily, I would say. It's good to, if you are thinking about starting a company, um, it is definitely good to have world builders and programmers on your team because you can then finesse, refine how you handle props in VR. It can be a little clunky, for sure, and it does take some getting used to. A lot of times, especially in uh, VR chat, the platform that we use, you have separate buttons that trigger something to happen from the actual object you're interacting with. So it's a bit like a magic trick where you're trying to direct the audience's attention to uh, a music box, per se, while you are triggering an effect to happen with the other hand over here. Mm -hmm. You do have a bit of a split focus, which I think is really useful to do a lot of practice with. I would say you can't do too many runs, and if you are building a team and putting together a company, I would make sure that you are taking few weeks of rehearsal time just to get comfortable interacting with objects in VR, not even in your own show, in a practice world, just like you would, I mean, sorry, just like you would uh, in a live theatrical performance where you have this month-long rehearsal process, you have your blocking, you have the journey of a prop, right? Where does it start? Where does it end up? How do you handle the prop? How does your character handle this prop? Is it something you like or dislike, I think all of that can still come across in VR, but you do have this added layer of the fact that sometimes when you grab a prop, it's floating two inches above your hand. And how do you compensate for that in the moment? Or yeah. is there a trigger that causes the prop do something that is actually not connected to the physical prop itself? These are all added concerns that you have to think about as a performer when you're dealing with objects in VR that you wouldn't have to in a real live performance. How do you hand that prop to participant or can they? You know, is it something that the participant can touch or is it not? And if they can't, you avoid them, as Brian said, sort of figuring that out and being upset that the world isn't limitless. So these are all questions that you want to think about when you're building your world or your story for performance VR. Yeah, and for example, like we have this cupboard that we open in the show and the button is here, the cupboard's up here. So I'll hit the button here, but I'll swing this hand open while the cupboard moves. It'll be a little bit a second before, a second after, but it kind of gives that illusion that I'm opening the cupboard. Or when I pick up Uni, our little unicorn, um, I try to hold it from the bottom instead of like the side, because other than it, like who holds it? stuffed animal like a coffee cup right nobody <laughs> they like hold it like it's something special um i also work a lot in front of mirrors you know because or at least mm -hmm. you know you can't really hard to take props with you in front of the mirrors because they probably exist in another world but just like running lines in front of mirrors has helped me you know sort of see how my avatar moves and you know, get used to the way it it, it, it it interacts what happens if i turn too fast oh i lose my arms i can't turn that fast right because they get stuck behind me or something i can't track that fast so you get used to sort of like trying and it's never going to be perfect or at least not now so you at least try to you know get so that it looks as much as it should in real life as it can but it's not going to look like it would in real life if you're a stick of butter because you can be right your avatar can be anything right yeah, I mean, You've I think you've been using avatars, haven't you? <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, I mean, playing a, a skeleton and then the under presents or, or a crab or a voiceless crab or a voiceless god, you know, or a, a bodiless god, sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you know, things like that. But I think maybe what might be useful because this is so specific and so many of you are performers, um, if we end up, I mean, it's about half past. I think yeah. it'll be useful for everyone. Uh, if you have some specific questions, then we can. Yeah. Oh gosh, I should have told to you this before. Them. Yeah. If you have specific questions, uh, you can always. If you don't want to, if you don't want to talk, you don't have to. You can just send them to me. You know, like, let me, let me come up here to the front. <laughs> let us all come up to the front so you can friend all of us. So you can send us, you know, yeah, any questions that you might have. 
there isn't that. Yeah, let's, thing. let's and open it up. Do you have any specific questions as it relates to your own company or performance or? Yeah, or and, and don't about... let the company thing fool you. Like, it don't, oh, right. it doesn't have, you Sorry. can just start just you, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, mm -hmm. you can just, it can start small, right? Don't, you, you could know. you could put on a show out there if you want. I mean, <laughs> yeah. we got like a little lobby out there. You could do one time with there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do a show about a tour guide and take people on tour. <laughs> yeah. Right? Life is falling apart because you know they have to get back to the their feed their cat, but they keep getting stuck in all these different tours. For one there reason, you go. Anything, anything. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and uh, either raise their hand or yeah, like physically, or we you know what we can give you one of these here. Look at this thing, fancy, fancy. <laughs> I can give you this. There you go. Run that around to the audience. So anybody? Yeah. Anybody? Right. Got a question? Anybody? No. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, Lord knows we can talk. So you know, uh, <laughs> but I thought if, if anybody's there were some feeling specific... like shy, you don't have to. We can certainly talk about um, <laughs> kinds of things. Like you know, as uh, equipment, I think is a is a big thing, right? So what kind of equipment mm -hmm. do you use to do this, and what kind of modifications have you done to your equipment? And if you decide you want the microphone, ask me. Just send me a message or raise your hand. Okay? Let's oh, talk about some okay. equipment. Oh yeah, so um, well, uh, I use an Oculus Quest. Uh, I'm still using my one, actually, my the first version, and it's been pretty okay. I'll probably have to get a two. Um, whenever I'm not in it, I leave it charging. That's a big thing for me. Is like as soon as I take it off, even if I have a second performance that same day, plug it into the battery. It's constantly. Charging. The other thing I have added to it is a weight on the back of the headset to balance out the weight of the front of the headset so that I can be in headset a little bit longer. Yes, question. question for me. You sure? Uh, yeah, take the, is it you? Yeah. And you, oh, oh, God. Oh, I'm dropping you might it. Have to use it. <laughs> you might have to hold it for I'm a bit. I'm here. I'm not sure. All right. Okay. If I put it here, no, it disappears. No. Turn it. I don't yes. know. Okay, well, we'll we drive. So okay. yeah. yes. Just talk loud. <laughs> okay. Am I audible? Yeah, I can yes. hear you. Yeah, so I'm new to VR. And to me, I'm still going through this phase where I'm forcing myself to believe in this world. Sure. And mm -hmm. what you are, since you are theatre people, it makes me intrigued to ask that when people are already going through this phase of believing in this fake world, and theatre is itself as a fake world, then uh, how is your practice evolving in during this transition? Right. So if I hear you right, you're saying that um, virtual reality seems very fake to you and you're wondering how our audiences are responding to uh, this VR world that they're seeing around them. Is that, does that sound like a, what you're asking? No. Also, how are we, are we uh, how do we adapt our performance to overcome that? To help with the suspension of disbelief? Yeah, to put it in shorter terms, uh, to me, theater sounds a fake world in a fake world. <laughs> so, which is also very interesting. You mean doing a theater is a fake world within virtual reality, which is a fake world? Yeah. I, so, right. Let me give this a let me give this a try. <laughs> um, so, everything yeah. you see in film has been developed over a hundred years, right? All the things from like you know over the shoulder cuts to um, the the the. The music swelling to CGI has been there and created to make you feel like you're standing in that world, to make you just to, mm -hmm. to draw you in. But it is a 2D medium, and you, everything that it that has evolved around movies has has been created to make you feel like you're immersed in that movie. And we've been watching them for so long that we can easily get in get lost in a 2D story in a, in a movie or a television show. You drop somebody into virtual reality, we no longer have to do over the shoulders. And you know, we know we we can add music to enhance, but we don't have to supply it to give you the feeling of what you should be feeling because we are interacting in real time. 
And the fact that your eyes are your, you know, your most dominant sense, being able to see everywhere you look, if you look up, if you look down, if you look behind you, it tricks your brain into thinking that what your, your experience is real. So now we get to the theater part where, you know, you're, you're now in a story or watching a story. We're used to doing that. We're used to getting lost in a story because we're natural storytellers. It's what we do. It's what we've grown up on. It's, you know, all the way through history to the prehistoric drawings on caves, we've been telling stories around the campfire and evolved, you know, all of the different venues that we have now. So I think that we as people need stories to help us get context, to give an understanding, empathy to so many things. And we're just used to being able to get lost in a story, regardless of the music. But also, just like in live theater, I mean, I think personally, proscenium theater right, where like this, the audience is sitting there and we're here talking, not even to you, but to each other, uh, is, you know, could be, as you said, fairly fake. But one of the oldest sort of agreements between performer and audience is the willing suspension of disbelief. When you go to see a piece of theater, you internally are saying, I accept that there are these limitations, I'm going to allow myself to get lost in the story. And I think that same principle absolutely <laughs> comes into bear VR and actually in some ways is less difficult because, because you can be, you know, I can be here with you, talking to you in a real way. And especially with immersive theater, that's exactly what we're doing, right? In some ways, I think it's actually less putting uh because you literally as Deirdre said get to be in the story in the world it's all around you physically even if and I don't even if you can feel the headset you know on your face and I, I don't even know if it's necessarily a problem sort of the artificialness to me that's kind of that's almost fascinating um being in the under presents we had these these various connections with these characters I mean there, there were even marriages between the, the <laughs> characters that, that the audience portrayed and the characters that the, that the performers portrayed. I mean, that's a fascinating thing. Where you have this artificial layer and you don't know these people, but then you, you're, you're, you're kind of working your way into these relationships that you would typically only have with people that you knew very, very well. And to me, that that's, that's a fascinating thing, the, the, the boundaries between the performer and the performance and sort of how how we're playing with with pushing past the boundaries of that typical audience performer relationship and 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 to, to some level the the discomfort and and the weirdness that comes along with having these these this level of connection with someone that you, you you've only experienced you know only have have interacted with by via an avatar so i think that's a it's a fascinating thing for me but i think that involves what Deirdre mentioned earlier, which is uh, you are having this uh, intimate face-to-face -face performance with someone, but you're also safe in your own home, right? You're in a safe space. So you can allow yourself perhaps to be a little bit more vulnerable, to be a little bit more open to connection, because at the end of the day, <laughs> you know you are safe and you are in a secure space, which I think is really one of the beautiful things about VR and performance mm -hmm. in VR. I know we had some questions over here. Questions? Yeah. One, two, let's two. do Car Karen. Right there, and then, uh, and then Anna. Yes, you, yes. <laughs> Cannot hear you. Are you, are you oh, here? yeah. Yeah, try muting. <laughs> and then, yeah, I saw you back there. Let's see. I'm going to try the microphone. No, no, we still can't hear you. Can't, can't make it go. <laughs> you want? You can type me the message. I know it'll take a bit. So we'll move on to another uh, question while you <laughs> while you hammer that out on your uh, thing. Uh, um, Ross, did you have a oh, question? Yeah. No, no. Anna, why don't you go ahead and go? Hey guys, Anna? can you hear me? Hi, friend. Hey. Yep, we can hear you. Good to see you. Um, no, Anna from um, 
from Immersive Theater, also a very talented immersive theater, currently doing pages in Los Angeles, California. Am I right? Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, yes, yes. Um, I'm, I have a, a technical question, I guess. I'm curious yeah. uh, what uh, solutions you guys have found uh, if, for example, your audience member playing Alex gets kicked out. Or mm -hmm. if one of the performers yeah. gets kicked out <laughs> mid-show, like how third, do you guys address yeah, that? Our third, our third character in the show is always technical issues, right? So <laughs> yes, right. we expect these things to happen. And we have, a, we have plans for that. So we have onboarding characters. And if we need to call in intermission, we can transport to another space, turn into our, one of our onboarding characters, a little bear or a little Lego man, and sort of come in and sort of call a halt to the show and fix whatever problem is needed because it is so new. Everything is new. Audience members is, are not really, they kind of expect it. It, it. it is a fact that we will have to deal with tech issues and everybody understands I fell off of Wi-Fi. So um, mm. I think that it's, that's, it's kind of- We also have a stage building manager. Contingencies and you try to, to create plan Bs for yourself. We, we always have someone uh, off platform in most cases, it's actually a Brian here. Um, so if absolutely necessary, things weren't completely <laughs> bananas, you know, where both parents, both uh, performers fell out of the world, we could say, you know, Brian, can you jump in very quickly and just uh, either take on one of our onboarding characters and say, oh, no, you know, lost the parents in the void and there's little improv scripts that i think we've all sort of come up with to do that but yeah so we do always have at least one team member uh off the vr just in case everything goes completely crazy um yeah. and if we're fortunate since, enough to have multiple oh, yeah. actors as well so uh, that's mm -hmm. that's nice as well if, if someone can't do something then hopefully someone else can step in for them but yeah i mean well that worst case scenario you just tell people we have to reschedule. They're typically pretty happy, yep. pretty fine with it, so long as you reschedule and then you know refund them if necessary. Just so long as you're yep. doing what you can do for customer service, people are generally okay. But just yeah, mm -hmm. yep. and If the Alex falls out and can't get in, we have a way to reassign mm -hmm. that part. Um, and for our show, that sort of works out because it's of the because it's dealing with dissociative identity disorder, mm -hmm. having someone who is being one of the alters, a different audience member step in as Alex actually weirdly works like with the story. Fronting. Yeah, in the story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah. So, so it may be when you're writing are... the script, maybe having those contingency plans, or if the main participant or main participants dropped out, that there's something that makes sense with the story as to why someone else might take over the part. Yeah, try to Definitely build in things that we've whenever seen. you can, and, but you can't think of everything. So when something new happens, then you have your contingency plan for whatever that is, whether it's it's going, oh, we should have done X. Now we know for next time, right? That, that'll that happen too. I mean, you know, I remember doing The Tempest and having the uh, the, the cable guy just insistently knocking on my door. <laughs> I just, I actually had to go, um, hold on a second. And then I muted myself and I opened the door and I was like, I'm doing it. I can't shut the door and went back to the show. Right. <laughs> and then I said, sorry, these things and, happen. Right? And like and gaming, I would say there's a lot of stuff that you won't know is a problem until it happens. Mm -hmm. Right. When a video game producer puts out a game, they've tried to think of everything possible, but there will be somebody who breaks a thing. And yeah, that'd be brave. Then. <laughs> and then uh, they go, oh, that's a thing that we didn't think about. You know, yes. One of the wonderful things or the learning experiences has been the combination of theatrical audiences with gaming audiences and how that differs and how you have to sort of think about how do these various types of audience members interact with uh, performance. Well, I highly recommend topic, testing. I wanna... Oh know, yeah, with, testing. With the proper test audiences, otherwise all of your best laid plans will absolutely go awry. Yeah, the there's the show you make and then the <laughs> show that happens when the audience comes in. It's a whole different show. It's a whole different show. I would add to to this you know, tech issues, right? You know, now as, as a performer, we're also technicians. We now have to um, troubleshoot Wi-Fi, uh, you know, 
queue all of our own shows. We um, we have to deal with like, what happens if the microphone isn't working for your audience member and troubleshooting, you know, all kinds of different things for our in ourselves and our audiences. And as far as equipment goes, just make sure that, you know, you get something that's going to be comfortable. I first got my Quest One, it's so front heavy. And I was like, I can't do this, I'm getting headaches. Well, since then we've added weights on the back and it's beautiful. Even even um, Steve, who's on a Quest Two, he had to get, um, we got the knockoff version of the sort of pro strap, which is great, it was only 30 bucks. It sort of wrenches in really nicely. And we, we added weights to the back of that. I've added weights to the back of my G2. Like make your stuff comfortable. And if it fits right, it, you should be able to be in VR for, for much longer than you would be if you're like dealing with a heavy headset. I like to be tethered during my shows because I find that having um, a corded ethernet to my laptop mm. um, is, a, is a more stable Wi-Fi connection. So if you can, great. If you can't, I did all of the underpresents and Tempest my quest one so that was not tethered right but i had to plug it in because you know yeah. i'm doing a lot of shows <laughs> any other questions yeah I, I don't use a weight but i i when i was performing as krampus one and my headset did flop off my head and i had to deal with that in the middle of the performance so maybe a weight would have helped during that situation i don't know <laughs> let's pick up one eventually uh, we have questions over here Thundercat, did you have a question you wanted to ask? No, okay. Oh, no, just like your hand was up. All right. Um, I would say uh, intimacy and connection is really what uh, performance is about, whether it's between your actors or your audience members. Um, what are some of the more platform um, popular platforms and um, that you can use for VR production? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, so you can use Alt Space. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and people do. Uh, I would say it's a little bit <laughs> it's better for stuff like this space where you're giving a talk or lecture. Obviously, we don't have legs, things yeah. like that. So the uh, this sort of disbelief is harder. Um, VR chat definitely has tech issues, but I think at the moment for budget production, it's probably one of the better options. Um, you can customize a lot of things. There are asset stores that have most of the props you could possibly want. It's very easy to bring in new assets. It's relatively easy to build a pretty basic world yes. even if you don't have a ton of experience. So you know there's uh, Neos and a few other platforms as well. And then there are certainly um, some higher end more expensive <laughs> platforms yeah. that uh, are in use that I know some companies are using. You also, if you have the resources, time, money, you can absolutely build your own app. But all of these have their own sort of problems and they all have their own pros and cons, I would say. I think one of the reasons I like I in general for starting out, I would in VR chat is that they're quest friendly, right? Whereas Sansar, Neos, and some of the higher end ones are not. And uh, like a lot of our audience are on quest. But I think the, the, the typical thing you see is about nine tenths of your audience are on quest. So you can do wonderful things in Neos and these other PC uh, exclusive platforms, but you're just not going to get nearly as many people. And we like to make theater for people and not just theoretical, to... you know, just do it for ourselves, you know? We're trying mm -hmm. to, in addition, because this is also new, we're building a community, right? So all of you are here because you're interested in exploring this this crazy, brave new medium we've found ourselves in. And Quest, it has issues, but also it's one of the more affordable and readily available to the general public. So if we want to start building an audience, building interest, I think performing on platforms that are quest compatible is probably the best thing you can do mm -hmm. because that's where as uh, Deirdre and Brian both said like that's where most of your audience is going to come from mm -hmm. so you know maybe one day everyone will have a thousand dollar motion capture and uh, PC headsets maybe <laughs> but <laughs> probably not you know most people they can afford 
or you know maybe as a gift uh, people can afford three hundred dollars is a the thing they're like okay i want to test this out so i'll get a headset or even you know go somewhere where they can try a headset a lot of universities now are uh employing headsets so you can go to your school library and try on an oculus headset and, and see a production through there mm -hmm. and i think but what i'd like to mention starting out is, that, to think about. is that uh vr chat is great and ideal for the sort of i guess full-blown theater that we do i don't know how to best phrase that but <laughs> um but not everything is that right uh so so much of life is performance, and so much performance is outside of what we traditionally think of as theater. I think that there's a wonderful opportunity here in Altspace to do things like guided tours. Uh, Rebecca Evans here in the back. Hey, Rebecca. She actually uh, has done uh, similar things in, in uh, Altspace, also in Mozilla Hub, which is a, a browser-based uh, VR application, or it's something browser-based which you can access via uh, VR headset. And, uh, what she's done is, is, among other things, is, is done sort of guided tours where they're telling you about a sort of event or, or a particular particular thing of, of, of interest. And then you don't really need a lot of the, the affordances that we we depend upon at, to do a more, uh, you know, a more narrative-based performance. But there are certain things like the ability to get people into the world all space is great with it. It's, it's, and, and also their events pays, like... Maybe this event just popped up for you and you just knew to come here. Like there's, there are tools that are available for all space that we don't have in VR chat that can uh, allow certain types of performance to be, to be better on this platform. And another one is Rec Room. Uh, Rec Room is more about playing. It's more about games. It's more about interaction. And I could see something like a game show being very successful in Rec Room. Whereas doing the sort of thing that we do it's a bit harder because you again don't have that sort of uh, freedom in your avatars which is one of the hugest things you know we need to be able to be character that we need to be for the performance but other platforms offer things that might be might not be traditional theater as you might think of it, but might offer opportunities for performance and interaction that, in ways that uh vr chat does not uh, provide so so readily and just also want to add quickly too that you know when you're thinking about doing a show you know think about the amount of actors you have in the show because you don't want you to have more actors than you have audience members and instances can be so small that you can't have you know you can't have you know too many people in here yet and i'm sure that will change but you can also become different people because you can quickly change avatars, right? So, you know, double casting, you know, your cast so that they can change out in different into different roles um, can also help you when you're thinking of, of, you know, your production and what it is that you want to put together. Uh, I think I saw a question over here. Claire? Hello, hi guys. Hey. Hey, hey. 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 So I, I make music, and... good to see you. Yeah, hi, hey, hello. <laughs> Uh, so I've seen the show, and something I was really impressed with was your onboarding process uh, in the first 30 minutes, talking with the participants. And um, could you talk a little bit about um, how you set up the expectations or how you would like your other performers or otherwise audience members uh, to themselves perform in the show? And maybe talk a little bit about, you know, is a lot of people are probably very shy, like don't know what to do. Um, and uh, your show wonderfully uh, got people comfortable, it got me very comfortable uh, <laughs> in getting ready to do a very unusual thing, be a small child. Like you don't, it's been a long time since a lot of us have been a small child, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Our onboarding yeah, space is very important to us. It's something that's incorporated in a lot of immersive theater to try to bring your audience into a space that feels similar and gets them in a place that is more receptive to whatever your show is. It also a function in fact, it takes a long time to get somebody into VR if they've never been into VR before, or they've never been into the particular application that you're using like VR chat, which is very difficult to onboard and like here, which is why we do the panels here because of the whole like event, which is brilliant. But for there, you know, we have to teach them how to get into VR. And we have a landing space where one of the actors entertains the audience, um, tries to get them into the mindset, troubleshoots, all those things while the other actor is in the world bringing them in. So uh, the mom is there to cap 
catch the audience and entertain them while we're waiting for the other people to come in. And I, you know, that I think is very, um, it's a very smart way to do, to do uh, onboarding and to bring your audience into your space. Well, and I think things that may seem innocuous in that onboarding. So, you know, if you got in there and the, the bear character was there saying, oh, you know, welcome, welcome. Uh, tell me about this thing when you were a child, you know, or tell me about your favorite stuffed animal. Or did you have a favorite game and then asks you to play hide and seek? All of that may seem, as I said, fairly innocuous, but it's not. It's getting you into that mindset without pushing it, right? Asking you to think about childhood, asking you to think about those relationships you had when you were a child. All of that is vitally important, getting you into the mood for the show. This sort of theory would say uh, one of the greatest examples of it is Disneyland. How many people have been to Disneyland or one of the sort of Disneyland uh, resorts or things like that? Okay. <laughs> so when you go on the rides there, right from the beginning, everything is putting you into the world of that ride. Right? The Indiana Jones ride, you're in a sort of temple thing and it's all unlike a set. That's onboarding. That, that's getting you into the frame of mind that they want you to be in. Oh, you're going on this epic adventure. No. So we are, we have to, when you're building an immersive experience, think about that as well. How are you going to get to the audience into the mindset that you want them to be in for this show? That sort of... Mm -hmm. I just want to add, too, that offboarding is also equally as important, right? Yeah. Theater essentially is a social place to go and you don't want to lose that opportunity for your audience members to come together then you know get, say hi in the lobby and then see a show and then afterwards have a place that they can also you know see everyone for the the, the show and and interact you know however long they want um but mm -hmm. we're gonna stay a little bit longer but it is yeah. it is two minutes to one o'clock so <laughs> i am going to wrap this up I yeah. am going to thank you all for coming. Um, the, we are the mm -hmm. Ferryman Collective. Show is welcome to respite. The Severance Theory, welcome to respite. Um, and I want to thank our amazing camera people, <gasps> Carlos Austin and Andrew Burr for helping us out. Yay! And streaming this out into the world. Uh, thank you so very much uh, for coming. We are going to stay. So hang out if you want. But I'm just officially closing this. Thank you so much.